Hello students of U.S. History and welcome to this lesson on the Revolution of 1800 in American History. Today we're going to take a look at Jefferson, Adams, and the political revolution of 1800 because uh, from this revolution we see that they're going to start getting dirty in politics. We see the birth of our modern American political system as a result. So the revolution of 1800, uh, you might be thinking to yourself, wait a second, in American history we've already covered a few revolutions at this point. I mean we had the American Revolution itself with the Revolutionary War, the whole don't tread on me kind of thing, uh, and then now that that's over we should be done, right? No, we had another one and that was with Shays Rebellion and how it brought about the Constitutional Revolution in 1787 to 89. Now that we've got the Constitution in place though, there's still some loose ends that we got to take care of that are going to help lead to a revolution in politics. And so this political revolution that we see taking place happens during the election of 1800. So something to keep in mind as we take a look at the revolution of 1800 in politics is the fact that um, we don't have quite the same system in place in the election of 1800 for president and vice president that we do today. And a lot of that comes about as the result of the election of 1800. Now uh, something to also remember is that we didn't quite have the same concept of political parties the way that we do today. Today of course we have the Democrats and the Republicans. They have very different ideas on what should be done with the government, how big the government should be, how tax dollars should be spent, you name it, they've got a lot of different ideas. But at this time we didn't have them per se, we just had different ideologies. So we had federalism versus anti-federalism. Um, Hamilton is one of the biggest proponents of federalism and had a, a very strong federal government in mind. And then Jefferson, as you recall, had a very strong state government kind of mentality in mind. But another thing to consider too is during the election of 1800, unlike today, the way that the Constitution had it set up was that the first place gets president. The person who takes second in the election gets vice president. Now until the election of 1796, we had Federalists that were getting elected. It was George Washington, a Federalist, and John Adams, a Federalist, who were elected the first two terms. But then we had that discord in which John Adams and Thomas Jefferson, former best friends but now political adversaries, could no longer see eye to eye on the big issues. And when they were president and vice president, as you recall from earlier talking about the Alien and Sedition Acts, this is not something that's going to work out really well during their presidency. It's up for grabs once again. And just imagine if today we had that same system in place in which the first place got president, second place got vice president. Once again, uh, Donald is implying that he didn't support the invasion of Iraq. I said it was a mistake. I've said that years ago. He has consistently denied what is Wrong. a very clear fact that Wrong. before the invasion he supported it. Uh, but what we want to do is to replenish the Social Such a Security nasty Trust woman. Fund, how Donald thinks, you know. He always Let is me, looking for some Chris, conspiracy. Chris, we don't gain anything. He has all the Iran is taking over Iraq. Iran is taking over Iraq. Iran Iran is taking over Iraq. Theory, we don't gain Secretary anything. Clinton, we would have gained out if they did it by surprise. Wait, wait, wait. wait. Time. Secretary Clinton, it's an open he, discussion. He, he, he says we would have gained now, if they did it by surprise. Secretary please let Mr. Trump's face. He's unfit, and he proves it every time You are the one that's unfit to get new jobs and to get exports that help to create more new jobs. Very well, you haven't done it in 30 years or 26 years. Well, any number I, you I've want been to a do. senator. You haven't Donald, done it. And you haven't I done have it. been a and secretary of state. And I have your done Your husband signed NAFTA, which was one of the worst things that ever happened well, to the manufacturing your industry. That is your opinion. You go to New England. That, that is just not accurate. Boy, did they get dirty there, huh? Uh, again, try to imagine if we had first place Donald Trump, second place Hillary Clinton, it'd be awkward. You know, not a lot would get done, even less than the federal go government gets done today. Slam. Uh, the revolution of 1800, though, the reason this is a big deal is because there's a lot of heated issues going into the election of 1800. First of all, um, some heated background issues we've got. There's theories out there amongst primarily the Federalists that say that we should have a greater alliance to the British. You see, France is having themselves a little revolution right now. Uh, it is violent, it is ugly, and there are Jeffersonians that say we should be with the French 
and have an alliance with them since they supported us in our revolution. There are those that say Britain makes more money and is a better trading partner. We should be more with them. That's a heated issue in this debate. Another big heated issue is the issue of the Alien and Sedition Acts. Remember that Congress will pass this in 1798 and keep it in effect until about 1800 when uh, they're targeting intentionally not only French immigrants coming over to the United States, but also targeting Jeffersonian supporters, people that are anti-federalists. It will lead to a lot of problems in our country. And the question is, should Congress be allowed to keep doing it? If you elect a federalist, they will. If you elect an anti-federalist, they won't. So that's one of the big issues that we're seeing. Another one, too, is this uh, common occurrence that we'll see throughout American history of states' rights versus the federal government's rights. A little thing called the nullification doctrine, which, as you recall from our previous discussions, was where Thomas Jefferson and James Madison anonymously will publish their Kentucky and Virginia res resolutions proposing that if a state or a group of states disagree with a federal law, they should be able to nullify that federal law and, because it does not represent their wishes. Now that's again a heated issue that we're just going to see coming up time and again throughout American history dealing with it over and over again but that's up for grabs here in the election of 1800. And the reason this is important is because during this election we start to see the development of a true democratic political culture in America, very much akin to the kinds of things that we see today in America. And why does that matter? It matters because many of you in the audience right now are 17, 16 even, maybe 18 already, and you'll be voting soon. This is where it all begins, where we have people that are actually appealing to you with a partisan politic kind of idea. All right, partisan politics means party politics. You've got Democrats, Republicans today. At the time, we had something a little different, but very much the same kinds of ideas on the effect, on the role of the federal government versus state governments and other big issues like that. Another thing, too, is that politics is becoming incredibly competitive. It's becoming more and more democratic. Democratic. Remember, democratia means rule by the people in Greek. And so now we're starting to see much more attention to the people who are voting in order to get their votes. And we don't quite have universal suffrage yet, of course, because uh, still you need to have property to vote, or at least a small amount of property to vote, or a business that you own. Of course, if you're black and a slave, or a woman, or a Native American, you're not considered here. But those that are voting, we're paying more attention to them now, okay? Um, so from this, we see the birth of political parties. Uh, at the time, though, we had groups called the Federalists, and the Federalists in this election were being represented by John Adams running for re-election. And for the Federalists as well, we've got a guy named Charles Pinckney who's been a big deal for the Federalists lately. And he is running, hoping to win second place to John Adams or first so that they can share uh, the role of having a, two Federalists in office at the same time and avoid that awkwardness of anti-Federalists and Federalists like we had in the last presidency. Speaking of anti-Federalists, they're starting to call themselves Democratic Republicans. All right, a little more exciting name. So the Democratic Republicans are being primarily led by the current vice president who's running for president now, Thomas Jefferson, and man, myth, and legend Aaron Burr, who's got himself a fun future ahead of him that we'll be discussing today and the effects that this election will have upon that destiny. These guys, what they're going to have to start doing is appealing to the masses. Good way to do that? Demagoguery. The ultimate demagogue in world history, Adolf Hitler. The man that was able to appeal to people's fears, that he could solve their fears, fix their problems, if they just elect him and bring him into power. Now we're starting to see that same kind of idea, although trust me, it's nothing genocidal, but we're starting to see that same idea in politics developing in America, where we're appealing to people's fears. If you elect this person, it's essentially the end of the U.S. Constitution as we know it. If you elect this person, you're going to end up in jail for losing your freedom of speech and having no state's rights. I mean, these are the big issues. And so in order to get your message across, you got to get dirty. Let's take a look at a campaign ad from 1800, the kind of thing that you might see. Now, the quotes that you'll hear from this video are actually things that were said during the election of 1800. Some political watchers are saying this could be the nastiest, most negative election season of all time. This campaign season seems like candidates have taken dirty to a whole new level. When pundits start shouting and Politicians start calling each other's names. It can seem like a return to civility is not possible. Like they, the very idea is a relic of some bygone, bygone era. 
John Adams is a blind, bald, crippled, toothless man who wants to start a war with France. While he's not busy importing mistresses from Europe, he's trying to marry one of his sons to a daughter of King George. Haven't we had enough monarchy in America? I'm Thomas Jefferson, and I approve this message because John Adams is a hideous, hermaphroditical character with neither the force and firmness of a man nor the gentleness and sensibility of a woman. If Thomas Jefferson wins, murder, robbery, rape, adultery, and incest will be openly taught and practiced. The air will be rent with the cries of the distressed, the soil will be soaked with blood, and the nation black with crimes. Are you prepared to see your dwellings in flames, female chastity violated, children writhing on a pike? I'm John Adams, and I approve this message because Jefferson is the son of a half-breed Indian squaw raised on hoe cakes, and Hamilton is a Creole bastard brat of a Scotch peddler. The nastiest, most negative elections... Candidates have taken dirty to a whole new... It can world. seem like a return to civility is not possible. Wow! All right, so you heard some of those things, uh, perhaps. Adams is a hideous, hermaphroditical character, which has neither the force and firmness of a man, nor the gentleness and sensibility of a woman. That's Thomas Jefferson, his former best friend. Now, meanwhile, Adams is saying about Jefferson uh, that he is a mean-spirited, low-lived fellow, the son of a half-breed Indian squaw, sired by a Virginia mulatto father. Ooh, those are fighting words right there. Dueling words, if you will. Martha Washington even went so far. I mean, Martha Washington, she's like a goddess, right? She'd never say anything negative. Martha Washington said of Jefferson that he is one of the most detestable of mankind. Ouch! Huh, you gotta do something bad if you pissed off Martha Washington. Or politics are just getting that saucy. So the election, the Federalists are going to end up going on the defensive in 1800 because they don't look too good. After the Alien and Sedition Acts and all this talk about an alliance with Great Britain, they do not look as good as they used to. And so uh, John Adams, rather than saying, you know, I'm going to get rid of the Alien and Sedition Acts, kind of goes on the record as being sort of a law and order president. We're going to keep the law as it is and maintain order by keeping the Alien and Sedition Acts. Let's make them even better. Let's improve upon them. All right. Meanwhile, he's also going to defend his idea that we need to militarily prepare and spend taxpayer dollars on building a standing army that would be used in a possible war against France. Whoa. All right. We've done a little bit of a turn there because remember it was 1781 when they started sending over some troops and supplies to help us out at the Battle of Yorktown. Thank you, Marquis de Lafayette. Now, Adams is going to present himself as the law and order president. Uh, this is kind of a fun theme that we'll see throughout much of American history when some people that are trying to get elected as presidents may say that they are the law and order president. And if you take a look at the uh, things that we have here said uh, ab about um, Jefferson, for instance, we have this saying, the grand question stated, at the present solemn and momentous epoch, the only question to be asked by every American laying his hand on his heart is, shall I continue in allegiance to God and a religious president or impiously declare for Jefferson and no God. All right, now the reason that they're saying this, by the way, is that Thomas Jefferson was a deist. Many Enlightenment thinkers, like Thomas Jefferson, were fans of deism, which meant that God is like a divine clockmaker. God makes the clock, makes the universe, makes the earth, sets it in order, lets it be, lets it do its thing. Now, the reason that many Enlightenment thinkers like Thomas Jefferson felt this way is because if you look at the previous 200 years of religious warfare and the way that people were fighting because, ah, you're a Catholic, no, you're a Lutheran, and then, ah, let's kill each other, didn't really make sense to those Enlightened thinkers. But Adams turns that around and says, you're voting for Satan and no God in the event that you vote for Jefferson. And they say, not today, Satan! Meanwhile, the, we have this lovely quote from uh, the Democratic Republicans and Thomas Jefferson that say, Republicans, turn out, turn out and save your country from ruin. Down with the Tories, down with the British faction. That's exciting, right? And so we're kind of getting that revolutionary mentality going once again. And then you can vote for Burr, who's always worth a shot. Pun intended for those of you that know what's coming. Now, another thing that they're going to talk about is a sex scandal that's going to develop at this time in which there are rumors about Thomas Jefferson and his slave, 
Sally Hemings. Now they called her the African Violet as they're talking about Sally Hemings. Now the, now the backstory is that Jefferson was married to his beloved wife Martha Wales Skelton who died in 1782 after, uh, after giving him six children and ten beautiful years of marriage. Now uh, she ends up dying nat of natural causes and when she does Jefferson will inherit not only uh, all of her land and her wealth which was substantial but also um, he will inherit five of her half siblings. Now I say half siblings because her father had been knocking boots with some slaves which was common occurrence for many of those slave owners at the time and as a result Sally Hemings is a slave but she is half white half black. At the time they would call her a mulatto uh, but we use the term mixed race. So she is a mixed race person that is now owned by Jefferson. Well Jefferson legitimately fell in love with her and there's plenty of substantial evidence to indicate that they spent some time together and he sired many children with her and sadly will never free those children from their enslavement and there's still a group of African Americans today that uh, claim direct descendancy from Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings. Adams is going to bring this up in the election campaign and it will make Jefferson look bad. All right, but not bad enough to turn away the voters because unfortunately many of those southern voters are going to say, eh, it happens. Now once the votes are tallied and we get the final numbers from all of the electoral votes here, um, we've got a tie in terms of the electoral votes and it's between Jefferson who carried the South and the West and Aaron Burr who carried New York. So since they have the same number of electoral votes of 73, we don't know who's first and who's second, but what's important is that we've got two Democratic Republicans that are going to take over now, not any Federalists. The Federalists are not happy about that, and that is something that's going to add to this backstory, including add to part of the story that we don't have time to cover in this video today about Midnight Judges and John Adams and how he's going to try and rig things against Jefferson after the election is over. Well, no, more on that some other time. But right now, the important thing that we're going to look at is that we've got a tied number of votes. Now, in the Constitution, it says that if we have a tied number for the electoral votes, it goes to the House of Representatives. And the House of Representatives has to decide on who is the winner. Now, it's February, the second week of February when they're doing this. It's taken a while to get to this point. And civil war, quite frankly, is looming because the House is dominated by Federalists, many of whom think that Thomas Jefferson is the devil and he's going to tear up the Constitution and, you know, burn what's left of it and piss on the ashes. And then a lot of people just hate Aaron Burr. He's just a guy that is not very likable to Federalists, especially not very likable to one man in particular. And that one man is Alexander Hamilton. Alexander Hamilton is going to work behind the scenes to say that Thomas Jefferson is the lesser of two evils. And because of that, um, Jefferson is going to end up taking the election. Aaron Burr will lose, but be elected as the vice president. Now, fast forward a little bit. We'll skip over a, a couple details for a second and just cover the fact that this is not a system that's going to work anymore. We've had a few elections. We've realized that this is not a system that works where the president and vice president run separately and we do first and second place. So fast forward to 1804. We've got a new amendment to the Constitution. It's number 12. The 12th Amendment to the Constitution is going to say that now, from now on, we're going to have president and vice president run on the same ticket together. We're going to have a ballot for those two at a time and then you choose which one you want based upon usually now their political party or their personality. Now by the way the House of Representatives voted 36 times before they were able to get the one extra vote that was needed in order to give Jefferson the win and that of course was because of the influence of Alexander Hamilton. So this is going to build a deadly division between these two men. Uh, the Hamilton-Burr rivalry is something that's gone back all the way to the uh, American Revolution. Burr and Hamilton served together. Uh, they were both there at New York during the retreat. Burr served with distinction. Hamilton did his thing as well, but they've never really liked each other. They even served in the same law office together. I mean, these were guys that could have been friends and allies, but politics got in the way. And that's kind of the point of what we're talking about today, too, is how politics can get in the way of civility, get in the way of even life. It can turn into a literal life and death struggle. That's what we've got with Hamilton and Burr. 
During the revolution, um, they, they saw things very differently. And then after the revolution, they will see things very differently politically as well. And one good indication of that is just the whole Federalist versus Anti-Federalist mentality. Now, uh, Hamilton is going to do a lot here to prevent Aaron Burr from becoming one of the um, primary figures of the Anti-Federalist movement. Aaron Burr, when he was approached by Hamilton to see about getting a vote for, in favor of the Federalist Constitution, Aaron Burr turned him down and said, I can't vote for the Constitution. It's too flawed. Too many things wrong with it. Too many chances for a, uh, a tyrannical federal government and it's almost as if that started the whole rivalry off in full with the politics because in 1791 Burr is going to defeat Philip Schuyler for the seat of New York in the U.S. Senate. Now, Hamilton is married to one of the Schuyler daughters. So because of that, that's going to make it so that uh, he's a little upset with Aaron Burr and he's going to do everything he can to go against Aaron Burr after that time uh, politically and maybe even personally here. Uh, in the election of 1800, we saw that Hamilton definitely screwed over Burr in terms of the voting and uh, got that one extra vote that was needed for a Federalist to uh, vote in favor of Thomas Jefferson. And so that upset Aaron Burr. And I mean, the guy, I'm going to admit, is being pretty patient with Hamilton up to this point. But then things just get bad. Because in 1804, Aaron Burr was not well liked um, by Thomas Jefferson or, you know, anybody, um, except maybe his close kin. So no one really likes Burr. And so uh, uh, Jefferson's going to essentially fire him as vice president. Now that we have the ability to run as president and vice president together, Thomas Jefferson in 1804, when he's running for re-election, will choose James Madison, father of the U.S. Constitution, uh, to help him run for president. And they will win. So Aaron Burr's looking for a job. So he decides to run for the New York governor uh, office in 1804. And who do you think is from New York that's going to work against him to prevent him from being elected. Yeah, you guessed it. Hamilton. At a dinner party, Hamilton's going to be talking with other respected politicians at this time of New York and say, you know, he's not a very good guy. Plus, quote, I could describe a still more despicable opinion of Burr, but I won't. <laughs> yes. So I've got smack talk for him. I've got things, dirt, if you will, on him, but I'm not going to tell you about it. The, the word gets out to Burr what Hamilton said, and he's like, whoa, I demand satisfaction. Tell me what you mean. And Hamilton is just not coming back and saying anything. He's saying, oh, I'm, I'm not going to talk to you about this issue. So this leads to the famous duel that we all know of. Duel, by the way, um, at this time is seen as a matter of honor, but it is illegal in most states. I mean, it's in fact illegal in New York where these two are doing their bickering and their arguing, but it's not illegal in Jersey, all right? So keep that in mind. Jersey's just across the river, and Weehawken, New Jersey happens to have a great place to do some dueling. Dueling something that's always gone back throughout history where if your gentlemanly manner has been infringed upon, you throw down the glove as it's said, um, and you tell your opponent that you demand satisfaction. Now at that point what you do is you choose an intermediary to go and talk to the other person's intermediary to discuss the issue. If they can't settle the issue for you two, then you choose the time and the place and you go and you meet at that location. So they meet. They bring the two pistols that are with them, and then they have a doctor on hand who is supposed to be there in the event that someone actually actually gets shot. But typically, no one gets shot because they just show up. They say, yeah, you're a man. I'm a man. Good enough. Let's not kill each other. And they go the other way. But in this case, Burr and Hamilton, they're going to take this thing all the way. All right. And so the doctor is told that he has to turn around because he has to have plausible deniability that he never saw anything, never supported any of this murder that's going to take place. And he turns around, as do the intermediaries turn around. So um, uh, Burr is looking for satisfaction, but he probably was going to go to this event and delope. Deloping, what that means is that you intentionally fire your shot either at the ground or above the opponent's head without actually shooting at your opponent. Now, the reason for doing that, by the way, is because um, it's a, a sign of honor. You're a man. You're bold enough to do this thing, but you're not actually going to kill the other person. So the way that it went is that they met at Weehawken, New Jersey on July the 11th, 1804. It's right across the river from where they live in New York City, and they chose the location. They had the doctor turn away. They had their intermediaries turn away as well to maintain that deniability, and we hear two shots. And then Alexander Hamilton is left mortally wounded on the ground. Now, how did it happen? Well, there's a few theories about what exactly went down that day. One theory is that Aaron Burr showed up intending to kill 
Alexander Hamilton misses his shot. He delopes at the ground, and Aaron Burr shoots to kill. The other theory is that perhaps Alexander Hamilton showed up intending to kill Aaron Burr and did not intend to delope. All right, now there's a theory based on this idea that Alexander Hamilton chose a gun that had a hairpin trigger installed on the gun. You see, guns at this time were single shot pistols. You load it, you fire a shot, and then you gotta reload it, right? It takes a long time. So in a duel, the plan is you, if you are going to delope, you shoot it into the ground, and then you're done. Or if you're intending to kill, you better shoot really well because you only get one shot. Now the problem is that when you shoot a gun at this time, you really got to squeeze the trigger, which affects your accuracy, making it so that you might actually miss just by inches. That often happens because you're standing in a way that makes you harder to hit and therefore harder to hit if you have to squeeze the trigger really hard. Now, uh, what Alexander Hamilton might have done is shown up with a gun with a hairpin trigger, making it easier to shoot and therefore shooting with intent to kill, but he missed. So, uh, the theory is that he missed and at that point, Burr pulls out his pistol, shoots to kill, kills Hamilton. All right, now, theory number three is that Hamilton actually showed up with the intention of himself dying. And he knew that he had to provoke Burr because he knew that Burr would not be someone that would actually shoot to kill unless provoked. So Hamilton shows up and he'd been depressed, severely depressed for the last couple of years. I mean, first of all, he had, I mean, there was a lot of people that said Alexander Hamilton could have been president, but didn't because of his rivalry with so many other political adversaries at this time, like, uh, like Thomas Jefferson. But also there was a sex scandal that took place that ruined his presidential chances. Uh, you see, there was a lady by the name of Reynolds and Maria Reynolds, and he was paying Maria Reynolds' husband money to be able to have a sexual relationship with her out of wedlock. So he's cheating on his wife with a married woman, and he's paying for it. That is not good. And so when that was exposed, not only does his wife hate him and she takes off and leaves, uh, but then also he loses Maria Reynolds, who he was kind of into. And then, I mean, he just looks like an idiot and will not end up getting elected as the result if he ever tried to run. So his political ideas are ruined. His political goals are shot if you will. And then his son, Philip, as just a young man, I believe Philip was 19. He was in college at King's College. He could have been the next great Alexander Hamilton. But Philip went to school and someone made fun of his dad and uh, was criticizing him politically and personally, the whole sex scandal thing. And so Philip demanded satisfaction. He went to Weehawken, New Jersey a year earlier to the exact same spot where Alexander Hamilton is going to challenge Burr to meet him. And Philip went and Alexander told him, you need to delope. You need to throw away your shot. So he did. Philip threw away his shot, and then the guy that he was up against shot to kill and killed Philip. Philip uh, is going to end up getting mortally wounded. He'll die in his father's arms in their home in New York on the kitchen table. And Alexander Hamilton never really forgave himself over that next year, and he was severely depressed. And of course, we don't have medication or any kind of treatment for that now. I mean, he hates himself maybe, blames himself hates Burr maybe as well, and decides that this is the best opportunity to die and not make it look like a suicide. So he intentionally fires close to Burr, misses, and Burr reacts and fires back and shoots to kill. I think it's important to take a look at Aaron Burr's side of the story as we, as we look at this. Now, the reason that it's so important to look at Aaron Burr's side of the story is because he's got a great story. I mean, the man's going to go on to become emperor of Mexico, for crying out loud. After he's being tracked down for murder and they want to try and prosecute him, he's going to leave the country. He's going to go to Mexico, become emperor, come back, and then, uh, you know, he'll be tried. To, the people want to try him for treason, uh, for maybe trying to start a rebel army to overtake the U.S. government. But, you know, he ends up coming back and practices law for the rest of his life. No harm, no foul kind of thing. They forgive him as, of his crimes. It's just a weird story, but a very, very good one. But one thing that we definitely do see from this is just how bad politics can get. So if there's one thing you take from this today is, yes, some fun facts, but politics don't need to divide us that much, okay? Politics can be something we debate about, argue about, but it certainly does not need to be so bad that people die. But we can also see how things can start to come back together with the conclusion of this story. First, let's take a look at how Jefferson will spend his presidency real quick here. We've got Jefferson is going to be the first American president to be president in Washington, D.C. Before that time, they were hanging out in New York. They were working on building a capital that was between two states in, in the South to make the South happy and help pay for the debt 
of New York and, the, and uh, many of the northern states. But now the South's happy. We've got a capital that's not in a state, but it's below the Mason-Dixon line, and it is uh, its own little district. So m much of the land, by the way, uh, was given to the nation by... George Washington, who was kind of the real estate agent on this gig. And Washington, D.C., at the time, was really very few concrete buildings. I mean, we think of this marble city today. It wasn't at the time. At the time, it was just some, uh, uh, there was some brothels. There were some bars. There were a few political buildings, mostly made of wood, a couple of uh, taverns, and they had some areas for doing some cockfighting. Gambling, um, but not much to Washington, D.C. yet. Now, one thing that we do see that is just being finished building when um, Thomas Jefferson arrives is the Capitol building, Capitol Hill, where the Senate and uh, the rest of Congress is going to meet, and the Executive Mansion, not the White House, by the way, because both of these buildings will be burned to the ground in the War of 1812. But the Executive Mansion, according to Jefferson, I mean, he's a simple guy. I mean, he owns a plantation, but he wants the government to be small. He wants it to be frugal and not spend too much money. He's a simple guy and a good indication of that. When he moved into the Executive Mansion, he said that it was big enough for two emperors, one pope, and the Grand Lama. All right, so the Dalai Lama. So this is too big for him. So what he did is he just lived in one of the rooms, and then he uh, worked in that room as well, slept in that room, ate in that room, and then next door to him he had his personal secretary and neighbor from Virginia, Mr. Meriwether Lewis. That was his note taker and doing that kind of thing next to him. Otherwise, the rest of the house was empty and was not being used for much. His inaugural address also gives us a good indication of how different Jefferson is. Because in other inaugural addresses from presidents so far, we had Washington and Adams both show up in a coach. They were finely dressed. They gave a big speech. Beautiful moment, right? Seems fine for the job. Uh, Jefferson decided to walk to his inaugural address, and he walked in his slippers and his pajama robe, all right? He didn't look exactly the part. He didn't even take time to comb his wild red hair, all right? So he shows up at this event, and the man that swears him in is actually a Supreme Court justice by the name of John Marshall, Chief Justice John Marshall. It's his cousin, and he's a Federalist. John Marshall is convinced that Thomas Jefferson is planning on burning up the Constitution, pissing on the ashes, and remaking America. Well, that's not exactly what's going to happen, but it's a neat moment where he swears him in. Then what uh, Jefferson does is he gives his inaugural address, and in this speech, normally it's big and, you know, uh, a little bombastic. Um, no, Jefferson gives a barely audible speech that no, no one can really hear, and they're very much let down after he's done. Jefferson hates making speeches, and he will not make any more speeches to Congress because he doesn't want to look like a king, and it makes him too nervous. So instead, he's going to start the tradition of writing his messages to Congress, and every president after him will follow that all the way until Woodrow Wilson in the 20th century. He was a college professor, so he kind of loved making speeches, right? So uh, Woodrow Wilson is the first one to start speaking directly to Congress once again, in in front of them. But one thing that we see that is clear with Thomas Jefferson is he wants to simplify the presidency. All right, good indications of that. He wants a wise and frugal government. In fact, he said, I wish it were possible to obtain a single amendment to our Constitution, taking from the federal government their power of borrowing. Just imagine what he'd say today to the way that we spend our money in the federal government with what, at the moment, $22 trillion in debt, something like that. Another thing that he wants to do is have a government that lives within its income by cutting everything that is unessential, cutting military costs, cutting uh, um, the muck and the mire of government that seems unnecessary, he'll do it. He uh, cuts major expenses that will have a dramatic effect later in the War of 1812. Now, one thing that's really good from this story that we can see at the end is, while politics were dirty up to this point, not so dirty at the end. We get on their deathbed a not-so-dirty conclusion. The once great friends, Thomas Jefferson and John Adams, are going to end up making amends in the last years of their life and start writing letters back and forth to one another. And both of them are going to die on the same day within like six hours of each other. It happens on, ironically, July the 4th, 1826, which is 50 years to the day after the adoption of Thomas Jefferson's Declaration of Independence by Congress declaring our independence. Now, I believe that within the 
story of the end of these two men's lives, we can see some incredible American symbolism to it. Uh, you see, like I'd said, they had uh, started to repair that broken relationship that politics had torn to pieces, and they started to exchange some letters back and forth, and leading up to that glorious day, July the 4th, 1826, they had established, reestablished their friendship once again, and a good thing, too, because these two men, as they died, they were the last of their generation of American patriots that were left uh, over from the revolutionary time period. And as they are, are both dying, they're going to end up exchanging those letters. And, and uh, at the age of 90, John Adams is lying on his deathbed, and his dying words were, Thomas Jefferson still survives. And then he passes. Now, little did he know that just hours earlier at Monticello, Thomas Jefferson, at the age of 82, had also died. And with that, we can see that while politics is sometimes dirty, sometimes it is tough to get through them, but we always are Americans. Thanks for watching.